Hello everyone, I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History's Lunch Program. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. And we're streaming live on both Facebook and YouTube where these videos are available to watch anytime afterwards. And if you've not already done so, please silence your phones. I note with sadness the death of former director of the Mississippi Department of Archives and History, Elbert Hilliard. Mr. Hilliard started his career with MDAH in 1965 and became director in 1973, retiring in 2004 after 39 years of public service. Many of you knew him in his capacity as director of the department. He also was the secretary treasurer of the Mississippi Historical Society for 44 years from 1973 to 2017, and many of you knew Mr. Hilliard in that capacity. He was close friends with William and Elise Winter, the former governor and first lady of the state. Governor Winter was the longtime president of the MDH board, and Mr. Hilliard worked closely with um, Mrs. Winter on renovations at the governor's mansion. And so when the time came for Mrs. Winter to do events, and she didn't love to do events, around the republication of her memoir, Dinner at the Mansion, there was no question but that Mr. Hilliard's easy manner and deep knowledge of history made him the perfect partner for her History is Lunch program. Many of y'all or some of y'all may have been lucky enough to be at that at the Winter Building. Uh, it was hard to get Mr. Hilliard to commit to do a History is Lunch. There were lots of great things that I thought he would be fantastic at, um, not least of which was uh, a program on former director Charlotte Capers, who he had lots of funny stories about. And uh, while I couldn't prevail on him to do more history as lunches, he always had great questions or comments when he attended and always loved the sports-related history as lunch programs. You could always see him there. Uh, I enjoyed all the time I was around him. Services for Elbert Hilliard are tomorrow at the Madison Methodist Church. This Saturday, March 23rd, there will be an heirloom plant sale at the Eudora Welty House and Garden. And this year, for the first time, you can buy plants rooted from Welty's original camellias. Urban Foxes will be on site selling coffee and snacks. Sales begin at 9 a.m. and will continue until the plants are sold. If this is anything like previous years, there are lines at 9 a.m. at each of the plant groupings that folks want to buy. So get there early. We're excited to welcome back Eddie Glaude, Jr., on the evening of Thursday, April the 4th, he'll be in conversation with the former director of these museums, Pam Jr., about his new book, We Are the Leaders We Have Been Looking For. And we'll have copies of his books for sale, and he'll be signing those before the event. Tickets are now available for the Mississippi Freedom Seder, which will take place on Thursday, April 11th, and is co-sponsored by the Golden Woldenberg Institute of Southern Jewish Life. Inspired by the original 1969 Freedom Seder, where hundreds of people of different backgrounds gathered to explore and celebrate freedom in the context of the civil rights movement, this communal event invites participants to the Passover table for an evening of commemoration, stories, and community building. You can find details and purchase tickets on the MDH website. We've been doing this for several years and it's really a fantastic event. Finally, I hope that you'll come back next week for History's Lunch when we'll be joined by Emily Crosby who will present Anything I Was Big Enough to Do, Women in the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Julie Cabot, author of the New University Press of Mississippi book, Love Letter from Pig, My Brother's Story of Freedom Summer. Julie Cabot earned her BA in philosophy from Brandeis University. She lives in North Chatham, New York, where she is a trustee of the North Chatham Free Library. Cabot was co-founder and executive director of Concerted Effort, a not-for-profit organization devoted to arts and education, and for more than 40 years worked with students in inner city and rural schools. Cabot has toured internationally as a composer, performer, singer, and storyteller. She is narrating the audiobook of Love Letter from Pig. We're delighted to also have Gail Falk, who as a 20-year-old student at Radcliffe College came to Mississippi in June 1964. She remained in Meridian after the summer project for several months and returned in 1966 as the Mississippi writer for the Southern Courier newspaper. We'll hear, we'll hear first from Julie Cabot, and then Gail Falk will join her for a conversation. Help me welcome Julie Cabot to the stage.
Good afternoon. And I'm very glad to see all of you. Um, music was so important in the whole civil rights movement and certainly here during Freedom Summer. Woke up this morning with my mind, with my mind, stayed on freedom. Woke up this morning with my mind, with my mind, stayed on freedom. Woke up this morning with my mind, with my mind. Stayed on freedom. Allelu, 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 allelu. Yeah. Walking and talking with my mind, with my mind. Stayed on freedom. Walking and talking with my mind, with my mind. Stayed on freedom. Walking and talking with my mind, with my mind. Stayed on freedom. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. So, <laughs> you will have to sing. <laughs> my brother. One of many northern volunteers, one of those the seg segregationists called outside agitators. We're very lucky today to have his close friend and fellow Freedom School teacher, Gail Falk, and she will join me a bit later. My book, Love Letter from Pig, who is Pig? Obviously, it's me. Uh, it was my brother's nickname for me. He was the only person in the world who ever called me that. And for him, it was a term of endearment, not a tease. We were very, very close. He really was my good buddy and my mentor, although there were eight years between us. I was the youngest of four and he the oldest, um, but that didn't matter and he loved to teach me things. Unfortunately, he died of cancer uh, just two years after Freedom Summer, and in many ways my book is an extended eulogy, uh, but it also has the voices of so many other people. So today I really want to concentrate on the fact that this is a story of love in many forms. There's the brother-sister relationship, the love of learning, a love, unfortunately, in the face of hatred, including nonviolent resistance, idealism and activism for the cause of civil rights, social justice, equality, and dignity. It's about breaking down racial barriers, developing relationships, building community, and nurturing, mentoring youth as future leaders. Luke wrote in his diary, I am fighting a nonviolent battle because I believe that hate begets hate and perhaps that love begets love. And he also wrote in his diary, it is tragic that barriers so foolish as color differences prevent whites and he uses the old language, Negroes, from knowing and loving each other. And it is only when these barriers are destroyed that any of us can find freedom. So, how do I turn this on? What? Same button, thank you. Technical difficulties. Okay, so, I'm going to show you some images um, first. And today I want to focus uh, on the relationships that developed between the volunteers and the young folks in Meridian. Of course, Luke, Gail, and the Freedom School students whom I'll mention were only a few 
of many, many, many activists who participated around the state in the Mississippi Summer Project. And the leaders, of course, were courageous African-American activists who had already been working hard on voter registration here in Mississippi. And of course, one man, one vote was the rallying cry for the Summer Project. And I assume that all of you are, are aware that in 1964, only 6% of African Americans in Mississippi were registered to vote because it was so dangerous just to try to register. And I am sure also that most of you know that Freedom Summer was Bob Moses' brainchild. Black activists in SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, had been trying to register voters uh, for at least a year, and they needed help. So they invited white volunteers and African-American volunteers from the North. My brother wrote a letter home to explain why he was going to Mississippi, and this is just a tiny part of it. I want to give you a sense of his scribbling. He was always writing, and luckily, he left this treasure trove of primary documents. Here is his letter home, and at the top of it, which you don't see, I said, I'm in a restaurant without paper and feel like writing, so I shall use napkins and hope that you can read what I write. He was writing on paper towels, anything he could find. Dear family, I'm through with finals and did well on all of them, including genetics. He was studying at Stanford Medical School at the time and had just finished his third year. I am going to go to Mississippi. You want reasons why. I don't want to sit back while Negroes are being denied their rights. I don't want to let others do it because it is my responsibility too. Receiving the letter, my parents freaked out, total panic, and they insisted that he fly across the country from California to our home in Rhode Island, determined to persuade him not to go. Of course, they were unsuccessful. While he was home on June 22nd, 10 days before he was to depart, a shocking announcement broke on the TV evening news. Three young men had gone missing in Mississippi, two white volunteers from the North, Mickey Schwerner and Andrew Goodman, and a local African-American, James Cheney. The story dominated the news. Mickey's wife, Rita, declared fiercely, it is tragic, as far as I am concerned, that white northerners have to be caught up in the machinery of injustice and indifference in the South before the American people register concern. And we knew she was right. So when my family was watching the TV evening news in my grandmother's uh, bedroom where we kept the TV, we knew she was right, but it was the first time that the federal government and the media suddenly were paying attention to what was happening in Mississippi. Here's a photo. Oops. Oops. Here's a photo from later in the summer, taken at the memorial service for the three young men at the site of the Mount Zion Church burned to the ground because Mickey and James had been meeting with members of the church to set up a freedom school there. For months, they had been hard at work preparing for Freedom Summer. And my brother is there, right there. <clears throat> at the end of his orientation, Luke was assigned to be a freedom school teacher in Meridian and was stunned. He wrote, Meridian, ugh, not Meridian. That's where Schwerner came from. What? We're going there to take Mickey's place at the community center. Good grief. What will my parents think of that? We are going to restore the community center, which was closed down after their disappearance. 
There is a strong obligation for us to do a wonderful job for Schwerner. My brother felt a deep kinship with Nikki. Both were secular Jews, born in 1939 on the cusp of World War II, and they grew up in the shadow of the Holocaust. Mickey knew that it was inflamed hatred that had led to the death of his relatives in Europe. Unfortunately, hate is still all around us. And I wanted to show you this. It's a sticker that I found in upstate New York behind my home on a bike trail. It was posted on a, um, on a telephone pole in, in 2022 and still trying to recruit volunteers because of white supremacy. The hatred is everywhere. And we still need to fight against it. So the white volunteers who came to the South needed at all times to remember to be respectful and follow the lead of the black activists. Freedom Summer would require breaking down racial barriers. So how were the volunteers Oops. different? No, no. They were I different. Going to the wrong slide. Here in the photo, grown up, very grown up, <laughs> are two of the seven sisters from the large Thompson family. And they were my brother's former Freedom School students. I met them in Meridian at the 50 year reunion in 2014. On the left is Dorothy. And uh, she was 13 at the time. On my right is Andresa, her older sister, who was 17. There were seven sisters and two brothers, and the Thompson sisters were called the Thompson sisters. Andresa has reflected that her mother never, ever wanted any of them to go out alone. And when she would be ready to leave the house, Andresa, her mother would say, Take Dorothy with you. Never go alone. So here is a video. So how were the volunteers different? They were different in the fact that they did not pose a threat the way I saw it. They were nice and friendly. At first, we thought they were too nice and too friendly because there was these white people that wanted to talk with us, wanted to be friends with us. And you had to kind of step back and look at it to see if they were trying to do some harm to us or trying to get us to get in trouble or something. And as time went on, that did not turn out to be true. And in large parts of it, though, was because of Luke. He was nice. He was really friendly. And he would talk to us. And he would actually let us touch him. And it was kind of like, wow, touching these white guys. And they're talking with us. So it was, it was really an eye-opening and educational as well. Only beyond the books, it was educational. Because we got to know them. And we got to understand some of them were not out to get us. So it was quite an experience. Wow. So it was about overcoming racial barriers. And here you see my brother at the community center, surrounded by the kids. Uh -huh. And <clears throat> when my brother and his friend Freeman uh, were told that they were coming to uh, Meridian, uh, Freeman wrote, Luke and I were told that when Mer Mickey was alive, the Meridian Community Center was the place where Negro kids smiled. 
It was our desire to see them smile again and keep them smiling as often as any human being could ever be expected to smile. To orient you to place and time, here's a picture of Meridian, Fifth Street. Here's a picture looking across Fifth Street, the community center and the administrative offices uh, were on the second floor. And the community center became an oasis for the children and the adults who hung out there. Here is my brother in the library at the community center with the younger children. And he wrote, today was my first day on the job. About 30 kids spent the day with us. It was like a second childhood for me. Reading to the kids, I was amazed to find a real child prodigy, Ed, an 11-year-old boy with glasses and an intense desire to learn physics. I decided to discuss atomic energy, fission and fusion, etc., but he already knew almost as much as I do about these subjects. When I made a little mistake about the speed of sound, he gently corrected me. Later, when Luke had the opportunity to meet Ed's mother, he discovered that, quote, she is worried about him. She thinks he's a disturbed kid because he is only interested in atoms. So here are a few pictures of the children, close up, looking relaxed. This is Lance Williams. He and his brothers lived right across the street. He was also, and called, Fifth Street Red, because they lived on Fifth Street. And here is his brother, Len Ray. And here is the picture you saw before. Andresa is behind Luke uh, with her hands on his shoulders. Dorothy just off to his right. Linda Martin to her right. And it is Fifth Street Red who I was told was always hanging on to one part of Luke or another. Here is the Freedom School. And um, <clears throat> early in the morning on opening day, Luke paced back and forth near the concrete stairway that led up to the front door. All the teachers were wondering, will anyone come? The principal at Segregated Harris High had issued a warning to his students. If you attend the Freedom School, you won't be graduating from high school. He insisted that his teachers not participate in any civil rights activities. And he threatened his students with expulsion if they did. And yet, according to Gail Falk, his stark warning went unheeded. Here is a picture of Gail teaching French at the Freedom School. And Gail, I want to invite you to come up. And I'm going to leave the picture up for a moment. So, Gail, would you read us uh, a little bit about the school? This is from a letter I wrote home to friends and family. Well, from the first day, that building was full of children. More than 300 students registered. Not all of them came every day. That was a huge part of the magic of it. Children came because they wanted to and not because someone was making them. There were 64 freedom schools around the state. Meridian was the only one that had its own building, which was a luxury. Formerly a Baptist seminary, the building had been neglected and vacant for a long time, but it came alive. And each freedom school was a world unto itself. There was no central administration to tell teachers what to do, 
So improvisation was key. And for the students, there was the added allure of being part of the civil rights movement. Andresa has said, we didn't just study history, we made history. At Freedom School, students were encouraged to think. The teachers treated everyone as equals. 15-year-old Robert in Gale's citizenship class wrote this. You won't find in any Southern white school system where they teach Negro history. But at Negro schools, what do you have? Negro history? No, the white man's history. Why can't we learn about our own grand grandfather instead of Mr. Dix? So Gail, citizenship and African-American literature were the two core courses. courses. Um, what were they about? We covered a lot of ground in that uh, summer of teaching. Um, we talked about segregation and racism. Uh, we talked about the new civil rights law. Um, we talked about African-American leaders from the past and in the present and writers. Uh, we had a lot of books that had been sent to us and we were lucky enough to be able to give each child their own copy of Richard Wright's Black Boy. Um, most, as, as I remember, none of the kids in our class had never in school read a book by a black author. Um, they loved knowing that someone just like them had been able to write such a great book. Uh, we studied the theory and practice of nonviolence. We role played what they might do if they were arrested or attacked in a demonstration, how to stay nonviolent. Um, we talked a lot about why voting was important and the nitty gritty like precincts and nominating conventions, um, not because our students were old enough to vote, but we hoped that they would go home and bring the information back to their parents. Thank you. <laughs> Luke observed, quote, many of the kids have had the curiosity beaten down in them, but some are beginning to become excited by the things they learn at Freedom School. When a teacher has a response in class, you can see it in her smiling face. Gail, unexpectedly, you found yourself teaching French. I did. <laughs> uh, we had a meeting before school started and we asked the students and their parents what they wanted us to teach. And the things that they said were French, or at least foreign languages and typing, not what we expected. Um, I was a, not a good typist, but I did know quite a bit of French. So I became the Freedom School French teacher. That's what that picture was that um, Julie saw. And we weren't, we weren't having to prepare for a proficiency exam, so we had so much fun with French. We sang French songs, we played games in French. Um, I had a book called uh, The Red Balloon about a little boy in Paris whose best friend was a, a, a red balloon, and um, they, they could see that there were children just like them in another place, uh, called France that spoke another language. This was just on the cusp of the time before um, people, at least the people in, that were in our Freedom School had televisions in their homes. So they really didn't have the image that our, all kids growing up these days do, that there's people all over the world. They were just learning that there are kids like them speaking other languages all around the world. Luke and Gail soon fell into a daily rhythm. Most mornings, we walked a mile or two to school through residential neighborhoods of modest, this is, I'm reading from another letter, uh, modest wood frame homes. Although most aspects of life in Meridian were segregated, surprisingly at the time, housing was not. On the way, as if we were on a checkerboard, we would pass by a row of white occupied homes, followed immediately by a row of black occupied ones. Our route took us through both poor and middle class areas. 
we learned that on one white street, just a few blocks from our host homes, a Meridian policeman named uh, Lee Roberts lived. Some days as we were walking, Roberts would drive by very slowly in his police car and just stare at us. This was unnerving, but despite it, walking back and forth to school during eight daylight hours felt safe. The walk provided a quiet time to plan for the day ahead. And later, Luke and Gail would learn that that policeman, Lee Roberts, belonged to the Ku Klux Klan, and his brother, who also belonged to the Klan, was one of the murderers. Like everyone else, Luke taught citizenship and African-American literature, but he was most excited to teach biology. There was little equipment in the science lab, so he searched for surprises, and he wrote, I brought a cow's brain and heart to the Freedom School, and a crowd of kids gathered around. They speculated on the origin of the heart and brain. I must have killed a large girlfriend who probably weighed 300 pounds with a large heart and a small brain. <laughs> or maybe she gave her heart to me and now she was heartless. One girl suggested I send the heart and brain to Governor Wallace of Alabama, who needs a bit of both. <laughs> Another day, he wrote, we dissected a dead field mouse. I asked them questions. Why do we breathe? What is heart failure? I presented imaginary patients and explained why they had their symptoms and I showed them what a doctor is looking for when he percusses a chest or listens to the heart or tests a reflex. I showed them skin under a microscope and they saw that color is less than skin deep and hardly that. I emphasized our biological closeness to other animals as well as to the family of man. Yeah, skin color is less than skin deep. I know this was a lesson Luke wanted his students to witness and take to heart. Slavery and racism were based on a mistaken notion, less than skin deep. Now, when I went to the reunion in 2014, Freedom Summer at 50, Gail introduced me first to Luke's student, Ed Turo, the precocious physicist. Almost immediately, Ed began telling me, you see, we didn't have any frogs or formaldehyde or anything like that, but Luke found a field mouse and dissected it for us. When the skin came off, why, you could see the brain right through its skull. It was transparent, and the bones, those tiny, tiny bones. So Freedom School really was love, love of learning, breaking down racial barriers, building trust. So Gail, what's something you learned by teaching Freedom School? Hmm. I learned that if you're lucky enough to have a school where the students come because they want to be there and the teachers are there because they want to be teaching, extraordinary things can happen. Um, learning can be wonderful. So we're going to go quickly through this next section, um, but we turn to the grief and uncertainty, the shadow that haunted Freedom Summer. Through the month of July, the FBI had been searching, and on a tip in early August, they ordered the excavation of a recently constructed earthen dam where buried deep, deep in the ground, they found the bodies of the three young missing men stacked one on top of another. In the days that followed in Meridian, Luke tried to help the children cope with the devastating news. He made this entry in his diary. 
I went to the community center today and asked the kids in the ancient Passover style, why is this day different from all other days? The kids answered, because Mickey and them are dead. What were they like, I asked. I never had a chance to know them. Many little arms were raised and all spoke at once. Answers like, he had a beard. He used to play Frankenstein with us. He took us for drives in the country. He made us work hard. He talked about dignity. Why did he leave his home in New York to come to Meridian where life is so hard? Because he knew that we needed him. He wanted to help us get freedom, our freedom. Freedom for what? What was Mickey really fighting for? The kids answered, freedom, and seemed puzzled. And then he goes on, but I'll skip to the end. I asked them, what would Mickey want you to do now? What can we do to carry on his work? So the parents of Mickey, Andy, and James wanted their sons to be buried together side by side. And of course, that was not allowed in Mississippi because of segregation, which pertained to graveyards as well as to life. Um, and then the Cheney family planned a private funeral for James. But there was a compelling need for everyone to come together in grief. Luke and Gail formed a committee and led a committee that planned the march to James Cheney's funeral, and that is the picture, Luke leading one of the groups, because they came from different directions. They came from different directions um, to converge on the church, where the private funeral ceremony was happening inside, and then afterwards there was a public ceremony outside, and, that has been very well documented. It was a very, very emotional and powerful service. Um, but the cover of my book shows my brother Luke and Reverend Culpepper leading one of the groups dressed in black. Um, and it was a very somber and silent march. So what do we have time for? Yeah. Not okay. a lot. Um, Gail, you went back after, uh, so read us a bit of the letter that you wrote explaining why you were going back to Mississippi. Um, it wasn't really common for people, you know, now we have gap years and people, students take semesters off from college, but at the time that was unusual and I had to write a letter to the college explaining why, why I was going to stay in Meridian for a semester. Um, so this is part of my letter. Um, before we came, uh, I said Negro, but you know, before we came, many African American people were satisfied with the goal of separate but equal because they didn't know any whites that they wanted to have the freedom to know. But in the community center, as we talked together and sang songs and ate lunch together and monkeyed with the kids, in the homes where we helped wash dishes, or ate breakfast or sat in the living room talking with our families, we gradually came to be trusted and loved, not as white people, but as people. If all the white volunteers went home to their nice homes and good schools, leaving the families we stayed with and the children we taught to bear the brunt of Mississippi's attempt to force close the crack we made in, quote, the closed society, I doubt if the new trust and understanding would endure. So when Luke re returned to medical school at Stanford, he saw many things in the North that were reminiscent of Mississippi. And that is, of course, de facto segregation, which is still too present all over the United States. In November, there was a gap in his medical education where the students got to choose where and what they wanted to study, and he went back to Meridian. He wrote, I am happy to be back in Meridian. I arrived in the night and slept on the floor of the Kofo office under the ping pong table. There were many cockroaches 
and a good number of them crawled over me. I went out for dinner with some of the kids. We had chitterlings, called chitlins, pigs' intestines, and they smelled something terrible. If they can eat chitlins, they can overcome almost anything. <laughs> so Gail and Luke were there in the fall. Um, they took teens out to test the civil rights bill, and one evening, Luke and his friend Free and eight teenagers faced a mob, and later that evening, Luke and Free were arrested and charged with contributing to the delinquency of minors. It's ironic, isn't it? So the glue that held it all together was music. Um, Gail, do you want to read? And then we get to sing. Okay. I wrote, um, these children will not grow up like their parents. Freedom songs have been their nursery rhymes. For their parents, freedom still means danger and bombings and beatings. For the children we knew, freedom is beginning to mean friends and new ideas and being brave enough to start to dream about and choose the life they want to lead when they grow up and learning to make these dreams come true. They are already, as one of the Freedom School students said, free in the mind. And is this not a lot closer to the meaning of that word, which none of us really understand? And then, very quickly here, one of their mutual friends and fellow uh, volunteers wrote in a letter, I believe that the music of the movement enabled us to maintain the nonviolent stance that helped us reach our goals. It was easier not to fight back and to preserve our dignity when we were as one with others in deeply felt song. Ain't gonna let nobody lordy turn me round. So, sing. Okay, so you know what? I'm a singer, so open your mouth. Give yourselves a chance to stretch and sigh. Go, ah. 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 So you open your mouth. Don't be shy. Let's hear it. Ah. Ah. All right. Ain't gonna let nobody, nobody lordy, turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. Ain't gonna let nobody lordy, turn me round. I'm gonna keep, keep on a walking, Lord. Keep on a talking, Lord. Marching up to freedom land. Louder. Ain't gonna let no policeman's turn me round, turn me round. Turn me round, ain't gonna let no policeman turn me round. I'm gonna keep on a walking, Lord. Keep on a talking, Lord. Marching up to freedom land. And here's one you may or may not know, which we're gonna do as an echo song to begin. So when I point to myself, it's my turn. And then it's your turn. I'm on my way. I'm, I'm on, on my, my way. way to the freedom land. To, to the freedom land. land. I'm on my way. I'm on, on my way. way to the freedom land. To, to the freedom, freedom land. land. I'm on my way. I'm, I'm on, on my way. way to the freedom land. To, to the freedom land. land. I'm on my way. I'm on my way, good Lord, I'm on my way, good Lord, I'm on my way again. I'm on my way, I'm on my way to the freedom land, to the freedom land. I'm on my way, I'm on my way to the freedom land, to the freedom land. I'm on my way, I'm on my way. I'm on my way, I'm on my way, good Lord, I'm on my way.
on my way. Good Lord, I'm on my way. So we're going to sing it all together, and, um, and there won't be an echo. So sing with me. I'm on my way to the freedom land. I'm on my way to the freedom land. I'm on my way to the freedom land. I'm on my way. Good Lord, I'm on my way. Thank you. You can raise your hand. We'll bring the microphone to you, and that way everybody can hear your question as well as the answer. <coughs> How many freedom schools did you say there were in Mississippi? I have to look at my notes. <laughs> and how long did that go on? Okay, so How many years? Between 30 and 40, I think. There were... Uh, but I, th I think you transposed the numbers. That's right, 64. But, 64. but, it, but I think it was 46. In the book, it's 46. Oh, it's 46? Yeah. Oops. <laughs> I typed it wrong. Julie, okay, 46. Julie, our wonderful friend, Len Ray, who was a student in the class, just walked <gasps> into the... Oh, room. Len Ray! I've never met you. <laughs> but we have talked... A hug is coming. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Um, so there were 46, and you said, how, did you answer how many, how long it lasted? I think it was just... It last. well, the kids had to go back to school, so we never didn't have a full-time school after the end of August, but at least in Meridian, we had um, after-school freedom school for some, you know, some of the people were on sports teams or playing football and they couldn't come, but we had a core group of about 20 students that came in the afternoons all through at least into the winter. Yeah. Did you experience any violence uh, or any uh, problems during the time that you work with the students uh, from the outside white community? Not at the school, blessedly. Um, yes. Uh, Freeman, who was Luke's roommate, um, was living uh, was living in a house that fronted on. Um, did I have that right? Yeah. Uh, and he, while he was in bed, his room was shot into from the street. Um, and he was arrested and kind of sh beat. Oh, yeah. And there, are, there uh, are stories in the book in the fall when they went to jail, um, mm -hmm. how, how they were, mm -hmm. you know, they were beaten up. Uh, uh, I have to say that the only violence I personally experienced, um, I had the protection of being a white woman, were two different nights when my car broke down and somebody stopped to uh, help me, a guy. The first time it was a black, uh, no, the first time it was a white guy and the second time it was a black guy. And each time they, each of them offered to sexually assault me. Um, so, you know, <laughs> there was, there was that, the violence against women still happening as well as the, the racial violence. Did the principal who threatened the teachers and the students with expulsion, did he follow through on those threats? Um, well, there weren't any teachers from the public school. Um, in the fall, it, they, they didn't expel anybody because they went to Freedom School, but there were students expelled there as there were in other 
um, like <laughs> we were looking at the exhibit about Brenda Travis and Macomb yesterday, um, but there were there were two students that were permanently expelled for wearing I support the Freedom Democratic Party buttons to school. Which they thought was part of free speech. Yeah. Thank you. There's a very interesting presentation. Thank you. Informative and very enjoyable as well. Um, you did rightly say that roughly 6% of the eligible voters were uh, allowed to vote in Mississippi at that time. And then you came and you worked um, and, uh, and um, to improve that situation. And um, so they have the 1965 uh, Voting Rights Act. Right. And a great, that, that increases the percentage by a great uh, 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 very substantial um, portion. How did it feel when um, people who had never voted voted for the first time because of your efforts? Mm. How did it feel when um, people went in to vote for the first time? It, well, as you said, that mostly didn't happen until 65 or 66. Um, I, I felt like it was the efforts of the black citizens in Mississippi and their efforts who had been le leading the way to voting that we were, we were part of it, but, um, and it makes me feel horrible every time I read the newspaper and see how things are going backwards these right. days and how we're losing rights that were guaranteed by the Voting Re Rights Act. Oh. That's for sure. Uh, my question is, uh, you talked about the younger group of kids in the Freedom Summer. What did you get, did you get, or was there much pushback from parents allowing their kids to come to this? Um, Meridian is a pretty big town, so there were plenty of parents that didn't allow their kids to come. But, but we, had, we had more than enough kids, so we didn't really worry about the kids. I mean, we, no, we just didn't, uh, we, 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 couldn't, we couldn't have handled all the kids in Meridian anyway. So. You know, we have a remarkable situation right here now because I'm glancing over at Len Ray, who was a student at the Meridian Freedom School. So, Len Ray, do you want to just say a word a about... <laughs> he was a little boy. He you were a little boy. He was, he you were, young. what, yeah. you were nine? Nine years old. Yeah. As a matter of fact, from day one, because I lived across the street from the Freedom School, I could close my eyes and just walk, and I'll be right there. <laughs> and Len Ray, you should know that I did have a little bit of imagery and your wonderful smiling <laughs> picture was one of them. <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, my parents went on and just pushed us on out of the house. That was our playground, the Freedom School. And it was a wonderful place. It changed our lives. It changed our attitude about the world. First, you know, as a child, riding in the back of the bus and drinking out of the colored water, water fountains or using the colored facilities, restrooms, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden, a movement comes there, and then you can be a part of it, even as a child, you can be a part of it. And we were, and it was just wonderful. We all just blended in when her brother Luke was there, and Gail, I love you so much, was there, <laughs> and Freeman, and everyone else. It, it put a big, made a big change in our lives. Made us all look upward, and new things were gonna get better. Yeah. I uh, met first, January 64, Marco Schwanner. He was my very first white friend in life, mm -hmm. killed by the KKK. And uh, he treated me like I was a human being. And that was something, white man right there who's treating me like a human being. And my grandmother always said, hey, there's 
good people. All people are, are good people. There are some. <laughs> and that made a change in my life. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> I, 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 I enjoyed the presentation. And, and it, it um, made me r reflect on a lot of things. Um, but to, to try, try to um, keep my question focused on, on your, your presentation, I'm wondering if your, your, how did your experience here make you more aware of social situations when you went back mm -hmm. home? Totally, it changed my life. Um, it, it made me aware of being part of history, that if you know that something's happening, um, you can stand up and be part of change. And so at like many people that were volunteers that summer, I actually was, um, when I went north, I ended up going to law school because I met Marion Wright Edelman and admired her and decided I wanted to be a, 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 a civil rights lawyer. And, and um, so I uh, en ended up, actually, I'll answer your question in a different way um, than I thought I was going to. Um, when I got older, I had a child with disabilities and I got a job being an advocate for people with disabilities. And I, as part of that, I went to the state institutions um, in the state where I was living, West Virginia. And when I saw the conditions um, that people were living in, in those institutions, people that were either developmentally disabled or mentally ill, what I said to myself is there, circumstances are even worse than people in Mississippi. And that kind of changed my career. I said, okay, if I was gonna stand up for people in Mississippi, I've really gotta stand up for people living in these horrible institutions. And Gail helped write or do research for the um, Americans with Disabilities Act, I believe, right? No, no. No, uh, but <laughs> no, but I did. I did some litigation. I mean, I spent the rest of my career working on closing state institutions and developing good community supports and good community services for people with developmental disabilities. Yes. I'd recently read uh, James McBride's new book, uh, "The Heaven and Earth Grocery Store," and the way he brings together. Um, uh, the black and white uh, and uh, various ethnicity communities uh, that he's writing about, but also also dealing with with disabilities is is just very compassionate and remarkable. Um, it's a beautiful book. Speaking of books, we have <laughs> copies of Love Letter from Pig for sale over here, and if anybody had a question or comment that we didn't have time to get to, I'm sure Julie would be happy to answer them here. Thank you all for being with us. Come back uh, for the events that we talked about earlier. Come back next Wednesday when Emily Crosby will be with us to talk about women in the movement. For now, help me thank Gail Falk and Julie Cabot for this program today. Thank you.